All right, so let's talk about everything we need to know. Navigating CASPA, figuring it out, um, and making sure you are on track with your application. Has anyone already submitted, by the way? Let me know if you have, because um, that will change a little bit of what I'm going to talk about. After you've submitted, there are a few things that you are not able to do or change or edit after you get that first submission in. So not yet, submitting soon. Okay. Maybe a couple of people have submitted, but trying to kind of getting ready, getting ready, waiting on transcripts. Okay, cool. So y'all are in a good place. This is perfect then. This is perfect. We will make sure that you guys do not make the mistakes that I see people make every single year on CASPA and on their applications. <laughs> so I've been helping pre-PAs now for the past eight years. I started after I kind of got out of PA school and got settled. I always say that in another life, I would be an advisor. Like I just love kind of diving into classes and planning and everyone calls me planner Perry and stuff. So I just love doing it. But in doing that, I have seen over these past many years that there are consistent things that can hold people up, can make your verification gets slowed down um, and can also make you get disqualified essentially from schools or they won't see your application if there are certain things that happen or are not met. So sounds like sounds like a lot of us are on the same page. Love that. Okay. So let's jump in here. How do I change it? Progressing. There we go. Okay, so this is just your CASPA, like an example of the login screen. I think most of y'all have seen this. Um, let's talk about applying early and what that means. I see some questions of like, is it too late? Should I not apply? Uh, I'm hearing it's too late. When, when should I get my application in? Um, this is still a good time to apply. And you can really submit your application up until a deadline. Like There are people who will submit the day that the application is due or whatever the day before and still get their application looked at and potentially still get into PA school. The reason we talk about applying early is the concept of rolling admissions, which many, many PA schools use. And what that means is it's a process where when your application comes in, the schools start looking at those complete applications as they arrive. They don't wait for them all to get there and do it at the same time. Um, and every school is going to have their own process for admissions. Everything's going to look a little different. And that's where... It can be a little bit frustrating because they don't necessarily tell you what that is. So some schools may have a weekly or monthly meeting where they're sitting down with applications and looking at it. They may have one person who their job is to just constantly go through applications. And we don't know that. So your application gets in for rolling admissions. It's complete. Transcripts are in. Letters are in. It's verified. The school starts looking at it. If they like what they see, they're going to offer you an interview. If they like what they see at the interview, they may offer you a spot in their program. And all of this can happen before a school's deadline is done. So these schools that have deadlines in August, September, October, they may be already accepting people interviewing before that deadline gets here. So if we think about it from just a numbers game, if you wait until later to submit, you have less of a chance to get in just because some of those spots are already gone. If they're accepting 40 students and they've already accepted 20 by the time your application gets in and now they have a bigger pool of applications and less spots available, then that could affect if you get a spot or not. Um, so that's why we emphasize the importance of applying early. At this point, and when I'm thinking about the messages and emails that I get, I would encourage you to think about why you haven't submitted. If if you like, it sounds like some people are like, yeah, I'm submitting this week. Like you have it planned. Great. If you haven't yet, really, really try to think about why that is. Why aren't you submitting? Are you, is it, is it something that's within your control or not? And if it's something within your control, I want you to try to prioritize as much as you can getting that application in. So things that would be in your control, essays, personal statements, um, those are within your control. Supplementals, supplementals take forever. Uh, I recently did an interview with on, the, on our podcast, it's called the Pre-PA Club, and I interviewed 
um, a girl, her name's Alyssa. She's on TikTok um, talking about her experience as a new grad PA. And she, I asked her, you know, like what, what was the worst part of applying? And she said supplementals. She was like, I completely underestimated how long it would take to do all those supplementals. So, you know, that's part of it. And that may be carving out some time, blocking some time off where you're able to just knock them out. Um, and, and, you know, we're editing a lot of supplementals right now. So if you are getting your essays edited, um, by us or someone else, um, you want to build in time to do something with those edits. Sometimes we'll get essays submitted and they're like, I want to submit my application tomorrow, but by the time we've edited it, then they have to make edits too. So you want to just think about that when it comes to timeline, but figure out why you aren't getting your application in. So personal statement, you can work on letters of recommendation, hold up applications so much. It's there's a fine line between being annoying <laughs> to your letter writers and being like, hey, get my letter in. And, you know, we don't want to pester them too much, but sometimes you may have to help them understand the importance of you getting your letter in. Like, why is that so important? You know, let them know, like, hey, these schools have deadlines. Hey, they're already looking at applications. Like, I really need your input. Um, I really value your input and that can be something helpful just to let them know so that they understand a little bit better. Um, letters can hold up applications earlier in the season or really a few weeks ago because CASPA just opened in April. There was an issue with transcripts. Um, I've been told that is somewhat fixed and hearing good things, but if your transcripts have not made it into CASPA and you sent them a long time ago. And I think someone may have said they're waiting on a transcript. Um, reach out to CASPA, follow up on that. If it's been more than a week or two, because I don't know if the transcripts were lost or they were short staffed. Nobody's exactly sure. Um, but if that is a problem, you know, keep reaching out so that you can make sure your transcripts get in so that you can submit. Um, experience details you can work on. Uh, those are the main things. But yeah, if y'all don't let me know, like what's holding you up? Like, what are we waiting for to submit? Um, if you feel feel comfortable sharing and being vulnerable and, and letting us know, maybe we'll keep holding you, hold you accountable to that too. Um, it was funny when y'all were saying where you're from. I saw some names I recognized. So that was fun. Um, personal statement. Okay, GRE. The, so a lot of schools will let you submit without a GRE score. You definitely want to make sure um, look at the program websites and a, and a more complete application is always better. But if the GRE is holding you up and they accept it in progress, I would submit without it and then just make sure you take it and add it later. Um, letters rec, shadowing, essays. Thank you all for sharing. Patient care hours. Okay, so patient care hours is an interesting one. Um, I do get asked a lot about whether or not you should wait to get hours on your application to submit. And here's my thought. If you need a certain threshold, if a school requires 500, 1,000, 2,000 hours, and you are trying to get those hours done to get there, then wait for that. But if you're just adding, if you already have enough hours to meet the minimums of the schools you're applying to, go ahead and submit, and then you can add new experiences later. So if it's just adding, you know, if I get a couple more weeks in, I'm going to have 100 more hours, um, but you're not actually meeting a new minimum, a new number, a new criteria, go ahead and submit. Just, you know, go ahead, get it in, and then you can add those hours later, and they'll see that it's ongoing also. You can also, in your experience details, if there is something ongoing and you plan on meeting a certain criteria, you can put in those experience details, you know, I expect to have 2,000 hours by December of 2023, um, just to let them know kind of like where you're at, how you're tracking, um, if there's room for that. Um, yeah, I really appreciate y'all sharing. Okay, so prereqs. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, supplementals. Yeah. Transcripts, essays. 
writer's block. Yeah. Personal statements are hard. It's very difficult. You're trying to put, fit a lot of stuff in there in a very small amount of space. So I get that that's extremely difficult. Um, we have so many personal statement resources. If you want to look at the PA platform, personal statement, like examples and videos and things that can help you. That would be like a whole nother webinar to go all through personal statements, but um, there is some, some assistance there. Complete all that procrastination. I have really, cause I'm also a procrastinator, but we don't have room for that. Okay. Um, so I see some questions in relation to this. I'm like not moving through my presentation, but we'll, we'll get to it. Um, is it okay to submit CASA without getting the GRE in first? It depends on the school. So check on the school and see if they allow that to be in progress. A lot of them do. Can I submit without finishing supplementals? A lot of the supplementals now are in CASPA. So if they're in CASPA, you will need to finish those before you submit. They're in the um, program materials section. If they're in there, some schools still have them separately on their website or they'll email them to you. Those you could complete later unless they specify you need to have them ahead of time. Um, but the ones in CASPA, you will need to complete before you submit. Does Casper hold off on application review? It'll depend on the program. So that's something that's program dependent, um, how they are incorporating Casper when they look at that. Some may look at it as part of the application process. Some may wait and review it later. We don't know. Um, but they have those are different with those specific dates they have. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. Um, okay, I'm going to go these questions from the Q&A to you. I love, I love that y'all are asking questions. I love when there's good questions. <laughs> okay, when entering the course title from our transcript on CASPA, do we type the exact abbreviations from our transcript or do we type out the whole title? You will always put exactly what's on your transcript. So that's one thing that'll hold up an application is if your transcript or what you enter for your transcript does not match, um, that can be a reason that your verification is held up as well as leaving classes out leaving transcripts out, you need to make sure there's a transcript sent from the original institution of every school you've attended. So that's dual enrollment, that's um, any like community college summer classes you took. If you took an EMT class at a college, like here in Augusta, we have Augusta Technical College um, and they have an EMT course and a medical assistant course. So if you took something there that's like an actual college university you'll need to request that transcript and it will be included in your caspa gpa and all of that um so definitely want to make sure that you are putting everything in there exactly the same um as on your transcript um i answered that one. Oh, i don't know what i clicked done okay um, if I still create an account in this year's CASPA to get familiar with it, even can I create an account to get familiar with it if I'm not applying to next cycle? Yeah, you can create an account even if you're not applying. My one caveat is don't save everything in CASPA because there is a chance that you lose that information. So that could be like your experiences, make sure you have those saved elsewhere. Um, I recommend MAPT. It's an online application tracker. And it's where you can put in all of your experiences and keep track of them. You can put in your grades, get your GPA calculated, um, and just kind of have everything in one place for when you're ready to apply. Um, so that's, you know, make sure even if you're playing around in CASPA, you are saving like personal statement stuff and everything else outside of it. Um, okay, I'm planning a career change from SLP, so I think that's speech language pathologist. I spent the last year in time in my graduate program working very closely with PAs, NPs, and doctors throughout the hospital on a daily basis. However, I have no direct shadowing hours yet. Is only a day or two of shadowing enough? That's a great question. This is a hard one because yes and no, like you have that experience working with them. I would 100% ask if you have that exposure, like, hey, can I shadow you? Like, can I come on a separate day and shadow you? Um, or see if they have friends that you could shadow too. Um, every school, again, is going to look at shadowing differently. It doesn't tend to be a requirement that they want a specific number of hours. It's more about showing you have exposure to the profession. So if you can reference that time that you spent with PAs, 
that will be helpful and showing that you understand the profession and know what you're getting into. And that's fine. Um, the other part of shadowing that's important is that it shows having a variety of it shows better understanding. So if you've seen a PA in a hospital setting, in a private practice setting, in a surgical setting, um, working with a big team, working with one doctor, working in primary care, you have an understanding of what that job actually looks like. And so that just backs things up better when it comes to your personal statement and your interviews versus, you know, I researched this and it's a great job. PAs make a good salary and you only have to go to school for two years. Like, you know, it takes away that perks approach and gives you more of a real understanding of what PAs do and why it's a great career. Um, so that's why that can be helpful. Okay. Um, kind of going through from the Q&A, guys, just like FYI. Um, after transcript entry, I'm matching the class each program. If I've taken several different types of chemistry courses, do I select them all or only the ones it directly asks for? So you're talking about the program materials section when you're matching prereqs for specific schools. In these cases, unless the school specifies otherwise and says to match every course that is relevant there, I would match the most recent, best fit, best grade, and it may not be all three of those, but whichever one fits best for that class. So like for this one, um, like if it just wants chemistry, and you have to take two separate courses and you did better in organic chemistry than general chemistry, you could put that as long as that's not another prereq. You cannot double dip prereqs. Um, so you wanna make sure you're not overlapping anything there. Okay. Um, is it important to answer both, both of the optional COVID and life experiences essays on CASPA? So the life experiences essay is brand new this cycle. It has never been on the application before. It does mirror a lot of what supplementals ask with kind of explain your life experiences to this point, how they impacted um, you personally, your decision to become a PA, explain your family background and that kind of thing. So those are common questions. This is just the first time that it has been universal on the whole application. So I do recommend anywhere you're given a chance to explain yourself, to provide more details, to do so on your application. And the life experiences is one part of that. Um, it's a great place just to give some context of your life, context of what's going on, like where you come from, what you're about, all of that. I've read some really, really good life experiences essays this year. And I think it it is a thing that gives context that maybe was missing um, from previous cycles. Like sometimes you feel like, oh, I would love to include this. Like, I don't really know where to put it. It doesn't really fit my personal statement. So it's really cool that this year I've been able to say like, that would be perfect for your life experiences essay. Like that's what it's meant for. The problem is we don't know how schools are using this. So I don't know how schools are using the life experiences or COVID essays. I would imagine a lot of them aren't really looking at the COVID essays anymore um, unless there was an issue in like a 2020, 2021 semester or something um, that might be like more relevant now, but we just don't know. And so same thing with the life experiences. So I would use the space. I would answer it. Do I think you're going to get penalized for not? Not necessarily, um, but I would try to answer that. Okay. Um, I can't really keep up with the questions in the chat. So if y'all want to put them in the Q&A part, I think that would be helpful. And then if there's like chat, chat, we can put it in the chat. Also, is this helpful? Like just answering questions? I want to make sure we're talking about what you guys want to talk about. So, okay, yes. I got some yeses. So we're going to keep going. All right. What do you do for ordering your transcript for an in-progress class? Um, so you should be able to order a transcript that shows that you're taking a class. Planned classes won't be on a transcript yet, but if it's in progress, you can order and show that. A lot of times now they will, I think they do require that you send in a transcript showing the most current semester. It just won't have a grade on it. Okay. Oh, this is a great question. How do I correctly add my direct patient care hours? 
it takes an average of hours. So it's not accurate if some days I work three days a week when other days I work full time when I'm on a winter or summer break. You're so correct. It is very strange how they ask you in the experiences to put the number of hours per week and the number of weeks worked. It doesn't really ever work out to be perfect. And a lot of times there is some variation there. Um, if you're at the same job, I would recommend figuring out the total number of hours that you've worked and then making it fit the best way you can to make the total correct. That's the most important part. So break it down to an approximate hours per week. And then you can explain in the details, you know, um, I had varying, varying shifts or whatever. Like I flex from part-time to full-time, depending on my schedule, something to give them that context if needed. But um, the main thing is making sure your total hours are right. Okay. How important are healthcare hours? I'm currently a farm tech, but it doesn't count as PCE. So I'm trying to get a certification as an MA. So it depends on the program. Some schools may count pharmacy technician and some may not. Um, you may be able to get a job as an MA without getting certified, depending on where you live. I'm in Georgia and most of our, I don't, I don't know, honestly, if any of our MAs are certified right now that I have, but usually I tend to look for pre-PA MAs because um, they're fantastic but you you may be able to get a job like that or one that'll train you potentially um but patient care hours those direct hours are going to be more important than the healthcare hours um okay great question yeah these are great questions i think it's helpful that y'all like are in caspa and know what's going on sometimes when i do webinars and people don't know what caspa is um or they haven't like been on there yet the questions aren't as good. So how should I add AP credit that I received in high school in my transcript entry? You will only be able to add AP credit to your application if it is also on a college transcript and if they specifically put what it was and what class it was. So you can mark a class as AP or a credit as AP in CASPA, but you have to have it on a transcript. So like, for example, um, somebody that worked with me, she was a medical assistant in our office last year, um, and she had taken AP Psych, which counted for some schools, but it was not on her transcript. It just said, like, AP credit and had hours, but it didn't have the classes listed, so schools weren't accepting that, um, so it does have to be on your transcript. I think what she did was she had taken classes at a different community college, and so she sent in her AP credits there and it did show on her transcript. So then she was able to include them. Um, but if you just have like AP scores, then it, you won't be able to include it. So, and some schools don't accept that for prereqs. So you have to double check. Okay. Um, if my transcript has abbreviations, do I still only write the abbreviation? Yes. You said an EMT course or MA course will be counted towards your GPA. Not sure if that's what you meant. Otherwise, why would they ask for that transcript? Yeah. So if you take it at a college and you got grades, that will go into your GPA. If they just gave you like pass or fail, that doesn't. But yeah, if you had grades, like I see people with EMT courses that they got grades for all the time. Um, usually it gives you a pretty good amount of science hours at usually an A. Um, but yeah, if it was just at a training place, like I took a CNA class. Um, so they did not have the wonderful online options that advanced clinical option offers, uh, when I was going through my training. Um, so I had to drive like an hour and a half back and forth every weekend for three months to get a CNA license. So clearly I would have done that online. Um, but with that, um, it was just like a training program. So like, if you did take a class through ACT, like you wouldn't include that on your, transcripts or GPA calculations because you're just going to get like credit and a certification. Um, but if you went to a college, you would put it on there. Um, what category does technical courses fall under? Example, immunology and immunology and pharmacology. So you would assign, when you're assigning classes in CASPA, 
you assign them based on the title of the course first and then the subject. This messes a lot of people up. So if your class was immunology, you would just assign it that that was the title of the class. Um, if it, the ones that get kind of messy are like, let me think of an example. If you had a class called biology of the brain and the prefix was psych 102, um, you would put that in as biology, not psych. So psych never counts as science. Um, if it was on the flip side, psychology of the brain, bio 102, you would put it as psychology and it would not count as science. CASPA doesn't care what you learned. They don't care what the class was about, what the subject was or any of that. They only want to know what is on your transcript, um, which if you're applying now, it's too late. But if you're planning coursework, that's something to look at if you're trying to figure out what's going to count for science or not. Um, so someone asked, OK, I'm trying to get familiar with CASPA. Can you explain the verification portion more? What does that look like in the timeline? So you make your application, you put everything in. When you submit, it has to go through verification. So all of y'all are like, oh, I'm working on it. I'm about to submit. Once you submit, you move into the queue essentially for verification. So they make sure that you have all of your transcripts from every school you've ever attended. They're going to look at the classes you entered and make sure that the credit hours are correct, the grade is correct, everything lines up, and that's where your GPAs will be calculated from. You will not see your GPA calculations until after you have submitted to one school and been verified. With verification, um, test scores can be added afterwards. They can be added ahead of time too. You have to request at least three letters of recommendation and at least two have to be in for your application to enter that verification. You can submit, you could technically push submit before your transcripts are in, before your letters are in, but it's just gonna sit there until those things are complete and it moves into verification. Once all that happens and CASPA says you're good to go, you're verified and your application is sent to the PA programs. You can add more PA programs later. You can decide to apply to more schools. But what's important to know is that CASPA is only going to verify your application and, and calculate your GPAs once on your first submission. So the very first time you submit, if you have classes that are outstanding, prereqs in progress, like some of you mentioned, and you want those included in your GPA and in your calculations, um, you will need to wait until they're complete on your transcripts to put in that submission, because um, that's only going to happen that first time. And then schools look at it, and then you wait for interview invites. Hopefully that makes sense. I recommend too, if y'all have not read the CASPA FAQ, spend some time and just go through the whole thing. Um, it's very helpful. It has little things in there, like little caveats, explains a lot of what I'm talking about. Um, highly recommend just kind of going through that. A lot of times when I get CASPA questions asked to me, even if I feel like I know the answer, I'll verify by just looking it up and being like CASPA FAQ grade equivalency or CASPA FAQ study abroad, and I can find exactly what I'm looking for and the answers straight from CASPA. They also are pretty responsive with support. So they have a chat. The chat's weird this year. It's like AI. So it's automated, automated but it was actually helpful for a couple of questions I had. Um, and then they have, you can call them. I called them earlier in the cycle and I didn't have to wait that long, like maybe six minutes. But with the transcript stuff that may have changed, but you can call them. Um, and they also are responsive on Twitter too. So, or X, X now, whatever. Okay. Uh, does working with PAs count as shadowing hours? I have observed them work and assist them with patients. You cannot double dip hours. So if you have shadowed PAs and worked with PA, or if you worked with PAs and you want to count as shadowing, you have to subtract those hours from your patient care before you submit. And I would also ask that PA if it's okay. Be like, hey, we've worked together. Would it be okay if I used a couple of our days as shadowing just you know, to show that I've seen what you do and talk about that more? Um, which I, as a PA working with MAs, I'm always totally fine with because um, clearly they are with me like all day long and see exactly what I do. 
but um, just double check so that if it was, if a school were to ask about your experience and contact them, they wouldn't be caught off guard of like, why did they put me down for shadowing? Uh, that does not happen a lot. If you think about, you know, schools getting a thousand applicants who all have 10 or 20 experiences, they're not calling and verifying all of those. But if they did, or if they like knew the PA or something, you just want to make sure everything's good. Okay. Is it okay to have some overlap between the life experiences and personal statement? It's okay to have some. I would not copy and paste or put the exact wording in both. I would try to expand. So if you've mentioned something in life experiences or mention it in personal statement and you want to talk about it in the other essay, make sure you're expanding and giving more information, um, you know, giving something new that hasn't already been talked about. Okay, I'm taking a class currently. Am I able to submit my application while I'm in progress for a class or do I need to include an in-progress transcript? How do I let schools know I'm taking that class? Um, so on CASPA, you can put classes in progress and then you would have to just uh, request a transcript from the school once you're enrolled in the class. Uh, but um, can you submit while taking it? That's going to depend on the program and what the class is. If it's a prereq that's required that you need completed by the time you apply, then you'll need to wait to be able to submit that. Um, but if it's something that isn't required, is just recommended or an extra class you're taking, it's not as big of a deal and you can go ahead and submit as long as they are okay with in progress, like just coursework or degrees in general. Um, okay, how do you navigate different deadline requirements of schools? I have some schools that require a fully completed um, and verified application and others that do not. Would it be better to just apply to the ones I have everything first and the other ones once completed or everything all at once? Okay, so that's an interesting question. So you said that some schools require a fully completed and verified application. So if you um, are trying to complete stuff, then like for the other ones, if you went ahead and submitted, they would not re-verify that stuff. They're not going to verify any new coursework or anything that's added after that first submission. So it sounds like you would need to wait until you have that completed for those schools. Um, but that's tough. And the other tough thing I want y'all to really think about when you're applying is start dates. We have more schools now that have start dates of January um, and something that has happened more in the past few cycles is people will get accepted to schools that start in January, but then they haven't heard back from schools they would like to go to that start in May or the fall. And so it becomes this really big conflict of deciding, like, do I take it? Do I go to this school or do I wait and see what happens and see if I get an interview or see if I get an acceptance later on? Um, so you do need to think about that, too, when you're looking at just um, timelines to make sure that you're going to be, you know, happy and satisfied going to a January start program if you're unsure about other programs. Um, it would be so cool if PA schools could just all get on the same page, like require the same stuff, start at the same time, maybe, you know, just make things more simple and less expensive, but that's not the way things go, so. All right, let's see here. How many volunteer hours do you recommend before applying? It depends on the program. Um, my general thing is like at least 100 hours. But with volunteering, I think it's more important to have consistent experience than a ton of different hours. So if you had like a bunch of little one hour things, I think that's not going to be as meaningful as maybe something you do once a month, if, even if you have less hours. So that's just something to think about when you're kind of like looking at experience and planning. Also, feel free to cut me off at any point if I need to stop. I like kind of can see the time, but kind of not. So I know you wanted to share the code and stuff. So let me know if I need to just stop. And um, okay. How do you view CASPA's calculated GPA after transcripts have been verified? You can download a PDF of your application and you'll see it there. Definitely do that just so you'll have it on hand and then you can review it before interviews also. 
Um, some stuff about experiences. What are do's and don'ts for experience descriptions? And then these are like are all together. What are some good ideas or topics to share in the experience? Oh, that's a different one. Hold on. I'll go back to that one. Um, oh, here it is. Should experiences be substantial or small or less time commitment? Experience is good to include if you describe it well. Um, so I think with experiences, that's a good question. You do want to think about what's meaningful. Um, one time when I was reviewing experiences, someone had put that they worked randomly at a gas station for a week and a half. And honestly, that brought up so many more questions for me. I was like, did it not work out? Or like, you didn't like it? Or did something happen? Like, why were you there for a week and a half and not for longer? And it just, I was, I just had questions. So, um, you know, think about that. If something really wasn't that meaningful to you and you have other things that are more meaningful, you don't need the hours, you can leave some stuff off. Um, but with experience descriptions, I like to see context. So if there's something important about like the population of patients you're working with, the people, um, the setting, anything like that to help kind of understand, you know, what was going on, what you're doing, it's helpful. A description of what you were doing, especially if there's specifics or it's not something well known that you can share kind of what your role was. Um, and then I do like there to be kind of a lesson, like what did you learn something more about you? Like, did you learn to communicate? Did you learn to resolve conflict? Um, did you learn time management, something like that, like a strength that came out of that experience that made it more meaningful. Um, okay, what are some good ideas or topics to share in the experiences essay? Should you stick to one topic? It's a smaller space. Yeah, so it's only 2,500 characters. Um, it'll depend on just you and your story. I've seen a few this year that have really just shared about their family or about like a specific um, experience they had that really shaped them. And then I've had others that have kind of gone through a little bit of all of that, where they talk about their family, they talk about maybe some things that happened in them while in school, um, growing up, and then kind of get to where they're at now. So it's going to vary, uh, but I don't think there's a right or wrong way to do it. If I'm submitting my application early to some schools that do not require the GRE and then going back to apply to others that require how this will, how will this affect my application? So GRE and test scores, you can add at any time. So if you submit and you wanna add a test score, no big deal. Just, you can add it at any time. So that's perfectly fine. Questions about that one. Does in-person scribing count as patient care hours? Um, it's going to depend on the program. Some schools count scribing as patient care. Some schools count it as health care. So you got to check. Usually it'll be listed kind of like on the program website. They'll kind of explain it there, but um, sometimes they won't. And you can always contact them and ask if there's a question. Ultimately on CASPA, it's up to you where you categorize that experience based on what you did in your role. We will not get through all these questions yet. So we have counseling options where you can meet one-on-one -on -one with a PA. Um, we do application review through that. So if you want to sit down with somebody and like look through your application before you submit, that's a great option. Um, we actually are doing 20% off of all of our essay editing for the next week. So if you have personal statement, supplementals, you want to get edited, um, we edit for content, grammar, flow, that kind of thing. And we'll just send it back to you within four days. Um, so we have that code, which is supplemental that you can use for 20% off. Um, and if you ever have questions, you can find me on social media. I'm the PA platform, most places. I'm physician assistant on TikTok, um, but happy to answer questions. Um, feel free to email me and all of that. You know, we're very accessible. We have our Facebook group, the Pre-PA Club. Um, I think we have almost 20,000 people in there, which is amazing of future PAs and now PA students and even some people who have graduated. So yeah, y'all have great questions though. I really, really appreciate all, all the questions, all the participation. I don't know if this is recorded or sent out any time later. Yes, yes, yes. it's recorded and will be shared. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Um, and then I may send you, uh, like, so if y'all look up the PA platform CASPA, I've done some walkthroughs on YouTube. So that may be helpful if you feel like there are things we didn't get through. Um, 
to kind of look at that and kind of see really if there's anything you can just look up like the PA platform experience details or the PA platform supplementals and you'll find blogs, podcasts, videos, all kinds of stuff to kind of help you out. So hopefully this was helpful though. Sorry, I like only got through part of my presentation, but I said everything I was going to say in there. It was just that easier to talk through questions. So. Awesome. Yeah, no, no worries at all. This was pretty helpful and I hope it was valuable information for everyone on the call. Um, as I put in the chat, if you're interested in checking out Savannah's website, getting in contact with her, working with her at any point in your journey, please feel free to reach out directly to her. Um, I will in a second also share the link to Advanced Clinical Training's website where you can scan through all of our fully online certification programs and take a pick at whichever fits your journey as well. So just one second while I type that in the chat. Yeah. Thank you guys. Thank y'all for, like I said, participating and um, yeah, and thanks for Advanced Clinical for having me. I got to meet some of you guys at our last MAPT conference, and uh, I really, I've only heard such great things. We, I see it come up in the Pre-PA Club Facebook group all the time about the training and how easy it is and um, well, well organized. Um, so it's a great option to kind of get you set up if you are looking to get certified. Awesome. Thank you so much, Savannah. And for those who are still on, please use code webinar 400 for $400 off at checkout any of our ACT courses. And we hope to see you all at our next webinar. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me at info at advancedclinical.org. Thank you all so much again for joining us. And thank you, Savannah, for your time. Hope you have a great rest of your week. Bye. Bye.